about uh, my hope uh, in the history of uh, Denmark, especially. Uh, Danish uh, society, even if something goes wrong inside of the family, they can rely on the whole community. The, the songs, the melodies composed and performed by the Ukrainian artists. So the, it was very uh, obvious that there was a, a longing for reconnection with the identity. Ukrainian identity is in a process of, um, I would say, not reformation, but formation. Welcome to Nordic Meta Modern. My name is Lena Rachel Anderson, and today we are meeting from across Europe, I think, uh, with our Ukrainian friends in Bildung in Ukraine. And uh, the reason why I've invited these amazing people is because they have started a building initiative in Ukraine. They're going to tell us about that. Um, but this is really about how do you how do you create a modern society? How do you uh, create coherence as as a people? And um, right now, as everybody knows, uh, Ukraine is being invaded by uh, Russia in a, in a horrible war. And um, some of our guests are in Ukraine, and, um, and I'll let them introduce themselves, and then we will talk about what does a building project look like in Ukraine. And uh, there's actually a very serious initiative uh, regarding starting a folk high school. And we're going to hear about that as well. And we're going to hear about Ukraine. So uh, welcome to Nordic Meta Modern. And my guests are uh, Elena Tocelina, Mikhail Krikonov, Katerina Yasko, and Sergei Chumachenko. And um, Elena, if you would like to go first, who are you and where are you? Um... I'm in Germany right now, then going to Lithuania uh, because it was impossible to work from Ukraine without, with the blackouts. And uh, I'm a communicator and I'm a co-founder of the Ukrainian Bildung Network. Uh, in my business life, I'm also a business trainer and a coach. Thank you. And Mikhail, please. So, uh, I'm Mikhail Vignov. I am... Uh, marketing strategy professor and at the same time president of Freshly Created in January this year, exactly before the active phase of our war as we uh, was started. So I am president of Ukrainian Building Network, and uh, I am in Kiev right now. And uh, my, my electricity was just switched on. You know, we have a very problematic life uh, due to uh, our circumstances and i'm happy to be here so uh, just to inform you we had uh, a, a drone attack on the kiev with 21 drones uh, in attack uh, 18 of which were downed but all the rest uh, are still creating the problems like i'm experiencing this morning Thank you. We're very happy that you're here. And uh, Katerina, please. Um, so I'm Katerina Yesko. I am uh, at the moment in Lithuania. Um, I have small children. So uh, basically since uh, March 2022, I'm based here, traveling to Ukraine from time to time. The next time will be next week. Um, I am a psychologist and educator. I've been working uh, with um, groups uh, as a facilitator uh, and um, as a also organizational consultant. Um, I'm also a big fan of uh, Nordic Bildung, uh, both Lena's books and podcasts. Uh, um, as uh, Mikhail, I was the scientific editor of uh, the uh, Nordic Secrets, the European story of beauty and freedom. And now we're working on how to also get two other books with Bildung, Keep Growing and Metamodernity get published in Ukrainian. And yeah, I'm complete for now. <laughs> and thank you very much for that. Uh, and Sergey, please, in some respects, you are the guest of honor here because uh, you started a lot of, uh, of what we're going to talk about. But uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Sergey Chumachenko. I'm in Ukraine now in uh, Kharkiv city. Um, I have a uh, very wild uh, 
uh, science background, that is why I can see the role of building uh, in uh, in issue of transformation society. Uh, that is why it was interesting for me um, as a people who are uh, looking for possibility to change Ukrainian society based uh, on uh, trust and uh, collaboration values. Uh, which is why the um, all questions about uh, building are very interesting for me. Uh, the first uh, meet with uh, this uh, uh, moment was in 2016 in, in, uh, uh, during the program that we created with Katerina Esko. Uh, 10 Ukrainian children and 10 Ukrainian teachers uh, visited uh, Sweden. And uh, there we saw the first folk high school, it was Biskop Sarno folk high school in Sweden. And I understood, uh, uh, no, I don't understood anything because it's absolutely a new phenomenon for Ukraine. Uh, but I feeling that uh, this is full of freedom and it's very, um, very important for me. Uh, that's why I began to study this phenomenon. Uh, and uh, 2018, I had um, a hypothesis that Nordic countries has unique uh, humanitarian technology uh, to change uh, society. Uh, and I'm looking, uh, looked for um, argument, and the first argument was the uh, book, The Nordic Secret. Uh, after after this book, uh, I studied many scientist papers, uh, and uh, I'm looked for the question of uh, this uh, hypothesis. Really, Nordic countries uh, has uh, this humanitarian technology to change society. Uh, that's why um, I and my wife uh, uh, both the two building of old school in Chernigo region and Ukraine for the project of first uh, folk high school of Chok, um, based on the mod on on Grundvik model Grundvik uh, ideas, and we are in process now. Well, thank you. So maybe I should just uh, briefly, for those who are not familiar with Grundvik and folk high schools and uh, Nordic history. Uh, share that uh, Grundvig was a Danish theologian. He came up with the concept of Bildung, which is education. We're going to talk more about it. Um, and uh, education, not just for the bourgeoisie, but for the for the young farmhands and farm girls, so the uh, rural population. And he created these, had an idea of folk high schools. And then there was a Danish teacher who um, eventually really uh, figured out how to create a the youth program really uh, on a boarding school for for young people where they um, could uh, evolve and get a sense of, of self and who they are. And uh, yes, the, the folk high school that you visited in um, in Sweden, uh, Biskops Arno is one of these folk high schools in, in the Nordics. So um, so let's hear about the uh, the building in Ukraine. You're all in, involved there. And we have a few more people on the screen today than we usually have, because normally uh, I limit the number of guests to uh, to three people. But um, since you're all involved and, uh, and you serve very different uh, aspects of, uh, of your program, I would love to hear more about. Uh, so what have you been up to? What are the plans? What? How did the rest of you get into this? And I hope that we can have a, an, orga or an, or an organic uh, conversation here so I don't have to uh, point to uh, to who gets to talk. So um, now I'm just going to ask who would like to start. Let me start this <laughs> story. So I'm in building uh, exercise or, or endeavor uh, because of Sergey, because he was the first uh, in my life who explained me that there is something very strange uh, going on in Sweden and in Nordic countries, in Denmark and so on and so forth. And after uh, exploring it uh, at least a little, um, I have a very strong feeling that it's something uh, simply absent in our uh, Ukrainian universe. Because uh, uh, it, it is explaining 
why any reform in education, I, I had um, uh, um, a relationship to, to, to some of them, uh, uh, never succeeded, never, and probably never in the world. <laughs> and, and it is the answer to very old, uh, tricky philosophical question, what is the first, what was the first egg or chicken? So if taking egg for adult people, so they are, they have to be first and they were not ever treated as the first in education, <laughs> the last, last sequence. So um, uh, um, the building uh, after we uh, started uh, uh, a, a small research initiated by Sergei uh, appeared to be uh, uh, the absent uh, part of a building, build, building, <laughs> yes, which which uh, gave us uh, a guess of of the answer. Then it was a, the, a wonderful, wonderful uh, book, uh, Nordic Secret, of Lena and Thomas. Bjorkman, uh, I have met uh, to Thomas and uh, uh, step by step, I appeared the student of Lena Anderson. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we created a quite small group uh, which started to think on uh, what to do next and what we'd like to do. The, our answer is we are not uh, are going to get uh, another one education. We simply uh, mostly interested in uh, transforming our society into more mature uh, and our people into more responsible citizens. And the building uh, uh, this Nordic model uh, give us uh, this uh, understanding or say promise uh, that if we will be uh, doing something, not simply trying to replicate a Nordic formula, but to, to adapt it to a crazy Ukrainian situation, uh, maybe we will help our people and ourselves. Probably th it is enough for, for this part of the story. And you started back in 2018. Um, so this has been going on for, for a number of years now. Um, oh, yeah. So, uh, for example, our uh, small, now growing uh, network, a Ukrainian building network, now is a member of two, net <laughs> finally one, a global building network. Uh, previously uh, the European Building Network, and we are fitting ourselves uh, as a part of uh, now global community. It's not a joke. It's a very, uh, I, I would say, a physical feeling and touch to people who would like to help you uh, we, we in very different ways, uh, uh, even materially and so on. And uh, you know, our uh, efforts are not limited to just uh, teaching ourselves and uh, uh, diving into a sort of research, but Sergei is initiator of the first ever, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, prototype uh, of uh, Ukrainian folk high school uh, located in a small village, Volchok, Chernigiv area, which was under occupation uh, uh, this uh, winter, terrible winter. So we, we are going to create something which have to grow uh, as uh, a result of self-organization, a result of, of uh, attracting more and more different people who will not be uh, like we, who will bring here uh, totally different ideas probably, but who could involve people in what uh, we are calling right now, uh, teaching our people to, uh, teaching themselves democracy. So uh, maybe Elena and, uh, and Katarina, uh, when did you join and uh, what were your visions or what have you been doing 
uh, in this group until the war started, because then I know things changed. But uh, let's just hear what the plans were when uh, when things were peaceful and um, and your initial plan. Um, would you like to start, Katrina? Because I think you were the first to join. Mm -hmm. I I may. Um, uh, let me start from uh, a, a memory or a recollection that um, actually the uh, we were very fortunate that notwithstanding all the complexity uh, and horror, this year has become very um, uh, empowering in a way for the Ukrainian building network. And this is, of course, um, a, a wonderful uh, result and outcome we are very proud of and um, my colleagues has made a huge effort to uh, to do that um, this year. Uh, at the same time um, I'd like to note that the processes similar to um, to building maybe besides the uh, the folk high school uh, that is now being uh, built um, um, but uh, in terms of the study circles, um, these uh, practices have already been there for quite a while. And uh, we can speak about a short term. Um, it, it could be um, at least what I noted starting from 2015-16, it, it was quite active and there were several um, important initiatives that emerged in Ukraine that um, were fully built on the principle of study circles and the Ukrainian um, educators, uh, activists, intellectuals, um, um, businessmen were reading books together with with the Ukrainian philosophers, um, spending time to reflect, to connect. So very similar things that happened in in the Nordic countries. But also there is a, a long term perspective, and one of the Ukrainian greatest philosophers, um, or probably the greatest one, Grigory Skavarada, is is actually associated with uh, with Bildung as it could be said now. Of course, uh, this this word mo most probably wasn't um, known at that time in our regions, but it doesn't mean that the the similar processes uh, weren't happening. So we can say that uh, in a way, uh, Ukraine uh, is um, um, reviving. Um, the the tradition, and it it has a, um, a rich tradition of uh, um, uh, folk um, education and exchange. And you you know well, Lena, uh, with about prosvita, and you speak about it quite often. Maybe we will touch up, uh, a little later. So, what we are seeing now is a uh, is a boom in a way. The the new practices and the the quantity uh, of different initiatives uh, is quite uh, impressive, also given a very um, severe, uh, complicated circumstances. It's, and it's interesting that people, notwithstanding all the challenges, they, uh, they long for learning, they long for development, and they uh, are true fans of, uh, um, are becoming true fans of uh, uh, the path of democracy and further democratization of society. And whatever it takes, uh, we, we will stand for it. Cool. Elena? I joined the team fully in 2020, but I got to know about the initiative in 2019. And uh, uh, what happened um, around that time, it's that we had um, election, presidential election, where Zelensky won. And uh, although right now he is a superstar and superhero for the entire world, uh, Ukrainians had their own perspective um, on, on that figure, of course, and uh, I have um, uh, I have uh, been witnessing as a as a child, of course, without too much consciousness, how Soviet Union collapsed and then Ukraine started emerging, and I can uh, describe this process of like 
getting to understand what is Ukraine, growing up together with Ukraine as a country, it was always a question like, what is Ukraine? And uh, I think around that time, it was already clear that we have a very active um, volunteer society because the first war, the war uh, of Russia against Ukraine started in 2014, and it was a splash of all kinds of volunteering initiatives. So there was a um, very um, intensive volunteering movement around that. There was um, public society, which was proactive, and there was a vast mass of people who were just living their lives, not being able to figure out what to do about the society and not even perhaps questioning themselves what to do. Plus, um, after so many push forward and move back uh, with uh, the revolutions that we had, with uh, all the changes that we had, there was uh, some kind of certain level of uh, depression in the society, like, oh, are we ever going to make it? And, uh, well, I'm just giving you a setting, a context. And uh, I got to know Mikhail through one of his being business trainings. And... Uh, like exchanging ideas about Ukrainian society, uh, he told me, you know, there is this group of people and they're doing something fantastic and I think you should kind of visit them. And this is how I got to know Sergei and Katarina and Lily and actually Irena Praskevich uh, from Lithuania. And it was a, a really fantastic, very deep, uh, I would even say slightly psychological event where we were dreaming, thinking about the past of education in Ukraine and about possible future. And this is where I heard Sergei speaking about building and schools uh, in, uh, in the Scandinavian countries. And since I've been working with uh, Swedish uh, consultants for about 10 years, and I knew that they were, somehow they were different. They always had their strange to me from the Ukrainian perspective, strange approaches, like they would always put the uh, security belt, they would always cross the road on the green light. So they were not like obedient, but they were good citizens, good citizens, and they, they liked being good citizens. And um, Sergei started telling about this uh, building approach in folk high school schools, which were uh, creating this uh, spirit of uh, community in uh, the Scandinavian countries. So this is how I got involved, and then the story goes. <laughs> yeah, I, I became one of the co-founders. I like I like the thing about the the seat belt. It was actually invented by some Swedes. So um... of course. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, and walking across the street only at the green light and stuff. Sometimes I do walk across the street at a red light just to... I suspect he or she should work at Volvo. Bet it's Volvo, yes. <laughs> um, so uh, so that was... Uh, and Katerina, as you mentioned, you have a really deep tradition for, for building in Ukraine, uh, Prosvita, and we'll return to that in a moment. Um, but so when you started... Uh, your your building group. It was uh, peaceful times. I I know that there was uh, the war in Crimea, but it was in a in a process of figuring out what is what is Ukraine going to be. Um, and then uh, you uh, got people together. You started a group. Sergey bought up an old schoolhouse from I think 1920. I've seen pictures of it. It is amazing. It's beautiful. And you're restoring the house. Um, and you got on track to uh, to starting a folk high school and to having a, a new kind of Prasvita movement in, in Ukraine. Um, and then the war started in uh, 2022 in February. And so now you have some very different activities, and I would like you to share those before we get into uh, to the bigger picture regarding Ukraine and Prosvita and all of that, because you've been very active uh, during those months of war now. Yeah, I think that uh, it's not more about volunteer doing volunteer business. It's about uh, sustainability, uh, what we must do in this context uh, during the war. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, once more, it's not about uh, volunteer 
volunteering. It's more about popular education uh, because um, three days ago we did uh, interview with uh, villagers uh, in Vuchok uh, and uh, ask him what uh, they think about possibility uh, to learn during the war. Uh, <clears throat> we have 20 answers and 20 people uh, said that this is very important to be in this process in this war time. <clears throat> and I think that it's unique possibility for Ukrainian society to start this process of uh, folk education, of people education. It's some um, rather difficult question to clear translate your Scandinavian terms in another languages, but uh, okay, it's maybe popular education, especially Linköping University translating now whole building as a popular education. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we, uh, from the first days of the war, we're looking for a partner in Scandinavian countries who can to um, preparing instructors or trainers for instructors in tactical medicine. Because uh, we needing of people with this qualification, it's so big uh, that they can't uh, understood this before the war. As for the civil sec sections, we need nearly 2 million people who have these knowledges, who have practice in tactical medicine. As for the military block, we need hundreds, thousands people who need these knowledges uh, and practice in, in this question. Uh, that's why um, we began this process. Uh, the background, uh, I and my son were mountain rescuers, and uh, my son was um, ready uh, uh, for the war in this question in the tactical medicine. Uh, but uh, he have he had non not formal education, uh, uh, and he needs uh, some official education and uh, certification this topic. And thanks to our friend and uh, partner Anastasia Nikrasova, um, we um, took very good, uh, good contact with uh, Swedish Agency of Emergency Situation and they were ready to come into Ukraine and study our instructors and trainers in tactical medicine. This is a unique situation because with Mikhail, we had many conversations with specialists in other countries, especially Poland, United States, GB, and other countries. And they said that they can do this, but uh, only outside of, of uh, Ukraine. Uh, our uh, Swedish partners were the first and one now uh, who were ready to do this systematic work uh, for preparing these instructors. And uh, in the first days of the May, it was the first one week trainer of trainers in this topic. Uh, we had the first group, uh, nearly 15 trainers of instructors in tactical medicine. Um, then basic uh, on this course, my son created the non-government organization Tactical Medicine North. And uh, they began this work uh, more with military and peoples and um, a little bit with civilian peoples because uh, he was very, orienteering to the needs of military sector. Uh, but <clears throat> after the second uh, after the second trip of our uh, Swedish colleagues, it was in October, uh, we, um, we spoke about uh, the needs of civilian sectors. Uh, that's why two weeks ago uh, was the third uh, business trip of our Swedish partners in Ukraine. And they uh, started uh, a little group for 12 instructors in tactical medicine for uh, civilian sector. And we created a faculty of civil protection in Folkway School. And now they began to work with the little villages who were under the occupation. Uh, 
о, о uh, situated uh, now near the border of Belarus or, or Russia. Uh, and uh, we have first uh, example of this co uh, collaboration. It's uh, fantastic. We have fantastic results. Uh, we see the people who are ready to study more and more. And uh, we created uh, a wild program that included not only medicine issues, but uh, psychological issues, mental health uh, issues. Uh, we study uh, dialogue uh, and uh, clear communication in communes. Uh, and the last step is the democratic uh, education or citizen education. This very interesting question, um, how Ukrainian people in poorer um, regions understanding was this uh, democratic. Uh, during this uh, uh, interview, they asked, uh, are these people needs uh, the big program to understand what this democratic. We have zero uh, answer that they are need uh, uh, this program. It's not uh, about uh, that they um, understand all about uh, democratic. It's about uh, uh, situation that they haven't any information how it works, uh, modern democratic uh, in uh, modern in modern world, especially in Nordic countries. And it's another very interesting question. During 30 years of our independence, we have only one um, doctor's dissertation about what this Nordic model of well-being state, only one. You are the good to good to understand how work American democ democracy, how work British democracy, how work Indonesian democracy, and we haven't any information about what this Nordic model of well-being state. But I think, and not only I, and uh, some favorite uh, scientists in Ukraine are sure that this model is uh, uh, most better for developing Ukrainian, Ukrainian society. Uh, that's why <clears throat> we uh, uh, presentation, this program, uh, on the conference of Swedish uh, cabmen, it was uh, 8 December. Uh, we show all five steps of this program. It's uh, rather interesting for our partners in uh, Nordic countries, especially for macro region strategy of Baltic, uh, Baltic states. Uh, and I hope that um, this give us possibility to create a program of democracy education and uh, civil education too. Uh, any of you would like to add anything to that? Yeah, I would just like to jump on what Sergei was saying about the well-being society because uh, I, I was uh, able to experience that because, well, actually, maybe I should take this opportunity to thank Lina personally and Nikolai Tillich from uh, Nordic Building Network for inviting me actually to escape from the war in, in March. So I spent four full months in Denmark, uh, escaping from, from the full-scale invasion. And uh, uh, I was able to experience this well-being society. And I will start with a smile because this is what you get in Denmark when you are meeting complete strangers, either in a forest or in a corridor of a hoi school. They, they smile to you like saying, I'm okay, you're okay, we share this space. We are happy. And uh, the, the next thing, it's the society of help. Like if you need help, you can ask for help and you will get it. And it's a normal thing to do that. Uh, and I think it's uh, probably the safest, one of the safest countries in the world. And um, I could feel that anywhere. I didn't feel insecure anywhere, except for perhaps Christiania in, in Copenhagen. But um, all the rest, all the forests, all the fields, uh, everything was super, super safe. And uh, um, also I experienced the community. Uh, I was staying in uh, the house of Nikolai Tillich's family in, in Copenhagen. 
and they had those old buildings and those buildings they were forming a patio like a small yard and uh, it was april the spring and uh, uh, i was invited to the gardening community event so all the families from those buildings they got together uh, and they brought coffee and cakes and everything and they took their gardening tools and i'm like okay how are they gonna do this because uh, uh usually when neighbors in my country get together you get a trouble so there will be some kind of uh scandal over something but here they all very happily decided what they would like to do in the garden and was not like sharing responsibility. They started with what I like to do. So some people liked cutting the trees, others uh, taking away the, the, the dirt, others planting flowers. And nobody said like, oh, I want to plant flowers too, because if they wanted, they just did it. So it was not from the feeling of guilt or whatever, nothing negative. It was like, I like doing this. So I would like to contribute to, to my community. Uh, and another thing, it was a small community of a village in um, somewhere up Zealand um, island. And um, it was uh, um, this village's uh, uh, like founding day or something. And they got together, all of them, and uh, one of the uh, honorable members of this community, she gave a speech, then they were singing a song. Singing is also part of their culture, of, of the Danish culture, which uh, they are taught in the Folkhøjskole. And uh, this singing, um, this is how they start their every day in Højskole, they start with singing. And um, I asked one of the high school students because I was visiting also, thanks to Lina, I was visiting uh, three high school in Denmark and I asked one of the students like, why do you sing guys? Uh, and she said, well, we are not religious people. And I have to admit they are not religious people in Denmark, uh, but uh, this is for us like going to church. So for them, this is like a prayer because all of the texts are about happy life, good moods, how much they love Denmark. I haven't seen a single text about war or about disaster or some bad stuff happening. And most of those songs, they were created after mid 19th century. This is when Folkhoi School were started. And I can imagine that if 20, at least 20% of the society would go to those Hoi School and hear those texts and sing those songs together and smile to each other every single day for five months, then this wave will cover the entire community and they will be different. And just one last thought, it's like in one of Lena's books, uh, she gives this uh, model of uh, circles of belongings and it starts with myself. So I love myself, I'm in peace with myself. Then it goes to my family. I'm, I have a happy family, I can rely on my parents. Then it goes to the smaller community and then it goes to the nation. So if you're not happy, not healthy in one of those circles, you can rely on something else. And in uh, Danish uh, society, even if something goes wrong inside of the family, they can rely on the whole community because they have those rules which Maybe they are written somewhere, I don't know, but they all have the same sharing culture, happiness culture, I'm doing what I like culture, and I make sure that everybody feels safe around me culture. And I would love that to be in Ukraine as well. So I I mean, it sounds like I'm in, I'm in paradise. I'm in Copenhagen. Um, I do recognize... <laughs> A lot of what you're saying. I'm very happy you got this impression of uh, of staying in Denmark. There's some truth to that. I, we do have darker sides in the country. I'm not just going to pretend that um, it is paradise. But um, it's amazing that you've had that experience. And I and I uh, I've traveled in other parts of the world, and I can definitely tell that we do uh, things uh, in, in some respects differently here. So um, I'm I'm not going to uh, make you disillusioned and and say that you saw uh, you know. A, a Potemkin uh, version of Denmark, so to speak, but um, but we do do things differently. And yes, I think it is part of the reason is, is the folk high schools. Um, 
that got us a little bit off from your uh, uh, activities during the war in Ukraine, but uh, but you're right that is that is part of your background for for also returning to your uh, projects. Um, I don't know if you want to uh, share a little bit more about uh, what you've been doing in Ukraine or Katerina maybe would like to. Um... So yes, uh, I I did uh, flee uh, to Lithuania uh, since my husband is Lithuanian and we've been living in Ukraine um, for the past. Um, I believe eight years, uh, but uh, yes, it it's it still um, uh, has been a very intense year in terms of uh, the activities, and part of these activities were online, and um, uh, something that I believe is uh, is extremely important, and I've I've been dealing with it s since the beginning of the war is uh, actually trauma awareness. I, 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 I deeply believe that in, in rela relation to the Ukrainian building and Ukrainian future for the next, I don't know, 10, 20 years or so, um, trauma awareness is extremely important. And of course, it's not the goal, like uh, education around trauma is not, is not the goal per se. Of course, healing is, is, is important. But it just, I already see, and we will see more and more, how, uh, how trauma is affecting the ability to trust, to cooperate, to communicate effectively. And uh, we need to, um, to bring it to, to our awareness first, just to foster connection, just to become more, more conscious about people's reactions. And most probably we will, we will have quite um, significant aftermath and, and repercussions um, for a long time after the war. So um, part of my work was uh, dedicated to um, programs uh, for the Ukrainian um, uh, temporarily displaced people all around Europe and within the Ukraine. Um, many people left for the, um, the central and eastern parts to go to the western Ukraine. So it's, it's like internally displaced or externally displaced, doesn't matter, people lose their homes. Um, their ordinary life, their habits, and th this is extremely traumatic. So uh, just in the beginning of the war, I started this program, um, Unity, Resilience, and Power of the Ukrainian Spirit, um, and it was for women, and most of them were scattered all around uh, Europe, and some even around the world. There were also other um, continents participating. And what I would like to emphasize that besides some psychological support, what we interwove uh, into these programs was, was Ukrainian poetry. And every time there was a Ukrainian instrument or not necessarily Ukrainian because there are some typical Ukrainian instruments like Bandura. We used it a lot during the program, but there were also others uh, uh, like piano, flute, um, guitar, but always um, the, the songs, the melodies composed and performed by the Ukrainian uh, uh, artists. So the, it was very uh, obvious that uh, there was a, a longing for reconnection with the identity. Uh, people scattered all around needed to experience this unity, this, this connection. And that was the best therapy, uh, but by the way, for the first month at least. And then in the second part um, of, of the year, I um, carried out a program called Emotional Discharge Space. Uh, also in this time, for both for men and women and around 300 people started and then we ended up only with about 40 because of the electricity um, and uh, power supply um, uh, problems. But it was also um, the place uh, for um, very concrete practice of emotional discharge that we uh, taught people together with them, our colleagues from Germany, the trauma therapists, uh, in, so that people could um, also do the same things when they finish the program. It was this three months program. And also there is a community, very interesting observation is that very quickly with this kind of programs, 
uh, like a, I wouldn't call it a study circle, but a small community emerges. And this community continues to be in touch through the Telegram groups or other social media. So people long for connection. Of course, uh, our work around the books, um, as I mentioned, we, we were uh, involved in the translation of, of the Nordic Secret. This is Ukrainian version of uh, the Nordic Secret. And also th there are these books that we are uh, working on uh, having very serious uh, intention to get them translated um, in, in Ukrainian. We, we believe it's extremely needed. If we want to speak metamodernity, we need some good Ukrainian translation um, of books, uh, yours and possibly others, in order to really um, reflect upon the Ukrainian experience um, from this perspective. And the last uh, but not the least, you already know from the European Building Days, there was some very active activity in Lithuania together with our colleagues, uh, Rana Panskibichuti and some Ukrainian colleagues who have uh, started uh, wonderful um, programs um, designed to help um, mutual uh, exchange and integration between the Ukrainian and Lithuanian families. Um, several schools emerged here in, in Ukraine uh, for the Ukrainian kids, and there is a whole community around it. What is what makes the, this work interesting is that usually, uh, like the families, they live in certain place, um, and they are united by some habitual ordinary activities, and there is a school. So we can sort of have the community um, have access to the community and it, it makes the work a little easier and more interesting. Uh, so whatever ideas uh, we, we wish to bring, it's, it's quite easy and accessible to uh, get it through and people are very open to learn after they went through the first stress and after they kind of stabilized um, their lives, at least for this academic year, those who make the decision to stay for, for um, this year because of children, they opened up for, for learning, for development, for mutual exchange. And I think this is a very good fertile soil for building activities. So, uh... Following Ukraine from uh, from a distance and having met Elena and we've talked a lot while you were here um, in, in Denmark, um, I see uh, from the outside and, and please correct me if I'm wrong or or explain if 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 I'm right, uh, um, confirm if I'm right, that the sense of being Ukrainian, the the sense of peoplehood, the uh, the cultural identity, the uh, Ukrainian language. I mean, there used to be a, a, a huge proportion of the Ukrainian people who were Russian speakers. So you were a, a bilingual country. Um, I know that um, more and more people have uh, abandoned Russian and uh, only want to speak Ukrainian, even people who may not have been very fluent in Ukrainian. Um, I see almost an explosion of cultural awareness initiatives. I know that there is a train from uh, Kiev to Kharkiv or Kherson uh, with artists um, decorating the, the, the train. Uh, you even fucking, oh, sorry, won the Eurovision. And, um, <laughs> and so, I mean, there are so many things going on. Um, and this weekend was actually uh, four hours of uh, Ukrainian uh, Eurovision final uh, from a metro station in um, in Kiev. Uh, I don't know if you watched it. I, I watched uh, some of it on YouTube yesterday. And between the songs, you could hear the trains go by. So, I mean, there is an insistence on uh, Ukrainian culture. And, um, and, and I also, I mean, what you're saying, Katerina, with, with people who uh, our refugees left um, Ukraine and and who keep the connection through through culture. Um, so how do how do you experience that and um, and and how do you how do you how do you what is the sense of peoplehood and hope and future and community in Ukraine? What has the war done? That was a long question, but it, it sort of it's it's a fluffy thing. It's a big thing. So the question can be long. So can the answer. Uh, okay, let me start. Um, I would say that uh, the war 
the horrible it is, has concentrated uh, everything which is truly Ukrainian in uh, all people. And if before that, uh, I would assume there were some hesitations, like what is Ukrainian? And there were some sparkles of truth here and there. Uh, after the war started, it was like this catalyzer, like something which divides things and um, some things which were not truly Ukrainian, which were um, made uh, upon us we, fr from the Russian Empire times, from any other Empire times. It kind of segregated from what the true Ukrainian culture is. And then the boom started because if um, we, they, we go back to the 90s when Ukraine became independent, and this is like my uh, childhood into teenage years, and I remember that we were kind of looking for what is Ukrainian and we were presented with uh, what do we call Sharavarshina, which is um, like Ukrainian son, son in typical traditional um, outfits, um, which sounded a little bit funny, a little bit grotesque, a little bit circus-like, like a theater or something. And which uh, would not be, uh, we would, we were not able to identify ourselves with that because it was always in the realm of uh, some um, fun, some entertainment. Uh, so it was not real, not true to life, and not serious. And this is the image which was imposed on us from the Soviet times and then by Russia. And there was a long process or of separating this image from the what true Ukrainian is. But what this war has given us, it's like it was a huge boom of the Ukrainian culture of uh, artists, of graphic designers, of uh, songwriters, of poets, of everything. So the creativity comes from the true source in, in us, in nature. And this is what has started happening with this war. And uh, uh, the art, the culture now, it plays the second role, not just exhibiting what's inside of our creative force, but it's also a tool, as I see it, for processing the horrible stuff which we are going through. And I know you are, you like some of our songs and you, you, you used one of those songs in one of your events and it's a happy song. But um, I would name uh, like at least four songs which give this both a uh, spirit of I'm not gonna give up my land and I'm gonna protect this. And also uh, processing it as a peoplehood, as a one nation, because uh, what we have been experiencing, and it was also part of the Russian propaganda, it's division between East and uh, West. And uh, when the war started, uh, we got united through facing this amount of suffering, uh, which everybody experienced, of course, on a different level. But we were all confronted with one enemy, and the sensation that this enemy is uh, hitting on us because we are Ukrainians. Um, yeah, this is my part. Uh, no, I completely agree with what Elena told. <clears throat> I just uh, like to add some uh, some words that you know. Uh, we have uh, unpredictable sequence of events which uh, created uh, a, a synergetic effect in the result. For example, uh, I uh, am asking myself question, what, uh, how all the, uh, uh, mm, what we are experiencing uh, uh, mm, uh, looked like if uh, Russians decided not to uh, uh, say offend uh, a capital city first, for example, because you know it was a, a so 
pure demonstration that they are not uh, aimed at just you know eastern part or western part they're aimed at the heart of a country they're aimed at the pop entire population and the heavy loss we experienced and we're terrified with what we saw in Bucha and so on was just a demonstration which uh, strangely sounded probably but which helped us to unite uh, and uh, to throw out all this uh, previous ex experienced um, or imaginary differences between western part of Ukraine and eastern part of Ukraine and the, the art itself now is a very mighty uh, language uh, uh, for, for for people, which is uh, um, understood uh, and very clear to everybody. To everybody, let me give you a quite different example. I, I'm I will use the metaphor uh, Lena used uh, that of Denmark and this uh, gardening party and so on, you know, where the first question was what you'd like to do. If we are talking about democracy, almost nobody would like to do anything, you know, before. And what is the difference if you look at our army right now, Ukrainian armed forces, our military, they are winning because, because of strangely maybe will sound uh, self-organization and initiative, you know, which is dramatically different what, uh, and how Russians are uh, make, making the war. Uh, so the, the art is helping us to, to feel this unity, to feel this identity. Yes, Lena, you are right. Uh, Ukrainian identity is in a process of um, I would say not reformation, but formation. Such so, uh, this um, say sides uh, of modern uh, uh, a human being like a political identity, a political U Ukrainian. I'm feeling myself a political Ukrainian, for example. But, but, but at the same time, uh, being ethnically Russian, but this doesn't mean nothing right now. Oh, so now we all uh, are aimed at uh, winning our country and building our future. Not uh, a last example, if you will allow me. Uh, I am a member and expert of CEO Club of Ukraine. Uh, it's uh, the union of probably most uh, important businesses in our country and when they started internal discussion on the econ uh, economical uh, restoration or the strat strategy of uh, economical restoration uh, um, of Ukraine after war, uh, uh, very quickly we, we decided that it, it is a set of totally uh, incorrect words because we are not going to just restore. We need to transform our life, never returning to the previous state. Uh, we are not, uh, if we'd like to win, we are not, uh, we have not to wait until war with will, will be finished. We have, we have to start these efforts right now, not losing any moment. And it, it's, it's not, uh, the feelings and ideas of this small, uh, comparing to Ukrainian people, group of people. No, it's a widely, um, say, shared understanding. And the, the art is a very mighty and important part, which is like a glue, uh, making us more united and uh, trying to... I know, say, uh, accepting, more easily accepting ideas that we have to start from our, ourselves. That's why building uh, uh, is not education, in my perception. It's, it's something which is helping people to, um, uh, to evolve, uh, to, to transform, 
uh, to the upper <laughs> next level of uh, being a part of a world. So a lost, finally was lost. Suddenly, a lot of people felt this unity, felt being part of a globe, being part of a larger uh, number of people. If uh, before the war you will ask, you would ask uh, some say, Ukrainian pedestrian uh, uh, um, who you are, uh, they will probably uh, use different words to, to, to explain and to describe this. If you are asking now, probably in the vast majority of cases they will tell you that they are Europeans. The war that it uh, is putting this immense pressure on on Ukraine and, and your existence and your sense of of uh, being Ukrainian. I, I mean, it has been has sparked this new sense of being Ukrainian, but it's it's a, a horrible um, torture of of your people in your country. Um, it resembles in many ways the, the process in Denmark because we had a war in uh, 1848 to 1851 and, and again in 1864. And that's when we started the folk high school. So, I mean, uh, you're pretty much in the same situation, just uh, almost 200 years apart. Um, and it's it's interesting that these the, the human side of things uh, seems to be the, uh, the exact same. Um, so these old... Bildung philosophers may actually have understood something universal about us, um, but that—that's uh, I, I find that uh, I don't know. Um, it, I think it gives me hope, uh, but all because it also means that uh, that there is a time after the war and that you can actually, um, yeah, uh, shape yourself and and rise after uh, a. A situation like this. We've also seen how Ukrainian flags all over Europe. I was in Germany this summer and uh, across Copenhagen uh, there are Ukrainian flags and they're still up there. So um, so there's a, there's a huge solidarity with Ukraine in, in Western Europe. Uh, Mikhail, the first time we actually spoke in a, in a Zoom session like this was in, a, in a, um, a fireside chat where we had a guest from Belarus and somebody from the Balkans. And one of the things that I realized was this almost tectonic shift of focus from uh, the former Soviet uh, republics uh, that had this focus on, on Russia, of course, and speaking Russian and uh, the power was centered in Moscow. And it's, it's really been this tectonic shift in Ukraine and I guess in the rest of Eastern Europe of, of shifting attention and turning it to, to Western Europe. Um, and I, I know that uh, uh, you told me at some point that uh, your soldiers are learning English in the trenches uh, to uh, know how to use the weapons that you get from the West, but I guess also out of, of, uh, of just learning. And, um, and I know that Sergei uh, has been studying some of the English in order to read and, and hear the stuff that we've been talking about. So, um, so English is, is taking, uh, uh, getting a new role in, uh, in Ukraine. But I would also like to return to uh, the metamodern part that you brought into this, Katerina, because um, when I, uh, and the Eurovision is one of my major points of reference in, in European culture, because it is the only thing that we actually do share that does not involve a ball of any kind. Um, and each song is three minutes, which means that 42 countries can actually compete um, over this silly, uh, you know, silly song of the year. Um, and Ukraine won last year and uh, you just hosted the um, event uh, locally in the, uh, in the metro. But what has struck me uh, is that you've won three times and you were very close to winning in 2021 and there's been an extremely strong uh, undercurrent of uh, cultural heritage from Ukraine in the songs. And speaking about metamodernity and the, um, the, the multi-layeredness of our culture and of our understanding of the world, so the indigenous, the pre-modern, the modern and the post-modern, I see the war in Ukraine and also the culture coming out of Ukraine as um, an amalgamation of 
these many layers in Ukrainian culture and heritage. And I see um, a, a pride in, U in Ukrainian culture, uh, a way of integrating these many layers of, of uh, Ukrainian heritage. And then the fault line in the war between Russia and Ukraine is really against or, or between a very old world that the rest of Europe and the rest of the West had, you know, put behind us. It's it's a completely different mindset and understanding of what it means to be human, what it means to be a country, what is political power, um, what is um, respect for other people, uh, the way that people, or lack of respect for other people, uh, because the Ukrainian mindset and the Ukrainian, mo the Russian, sorry, the Russian mindset and the Russian understanding of what it means to be I guess an empire or a country, whatever they want to call it, um, is like a hundred years old. Um, some people call it medieval, but we have to acknowledge that even in the 20th century, there were, um, particularly around the First World War, uh, a militarism, a mindset that was patriarchal and that was extremely violent, uh, that continued into the Second World War. But then Western Europe left, left it behind us. Um, I'm not saying that we've been peaceful all along, but the concept of what it means to be a culture, what it means to be civilized has moved on. And what I see in Ukraine right now is this metamodern push towards something that isn't actually even there in many places. It's something that we're that we're producing together. Um, so so maybe we can we can conclude on that and, and how you see uh the transformation that you're going through, the formation you're going through, the metamodern part of it, the building part, you've already touched upon some of it. But, um, and by the way, we'll share the links for the music videos and all the four, also the four songs you were mentioning, Elena, so we need those. Um, but the, uh, the, the complexity of the cultural and political and existential situation in Ukraine and where you're, where you're going right now, I would like to, conclude on that um and what your thoughts are about ukraine after the war the first word which uh, appeared in my mind is the complexity the complex it won't be you know the romantic pink color we should paint uh our future life it will be very hard life frankly speaking because it it will be unfortunately um dramatically depopulized uh, uh a country uh with um a demographic uh with the demography shifted from more or less balanced stay to uh, say a women's world uh, because a lot of our young uh, men right now are dying in the trenches in the, in army. The loss uh, are very high. And with, uh, uh, say, uh, less amount of young people. Uh, but anyway, anyway, it it will be like you know like a, a cat which in our people's uh, belief has a several life so we we, we have to live uh, these several lives simultaneously uh, starting from now so we we will be restoring our culture we are started right now we will be reindustrializing on a new level, our industries and our economy. We will be returning to say natural entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit of our people. Uh, so rethinking uh, uh, collectivism, rethinking re individualism, rethinking uh, uh, responsibility. Uh, we we are constantly talking about. So it have to be reinvented. And uh, uh, and unfortunately, it will be a uh, world uh, in in uh, in a large part painted hockey, you know, uh, because uh, 
we, 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 our destiny is to live with this uh, dangerous neighbor for years and years to come. And we have to be uh, relying on, not only on the help from Europe, friendly Europe, uh, but on our own ability to uh, say to 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 get rid of any uh, uh, dangers like this in the future. Probably not any. We have to remember about the astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> and asteroids <laughs> and alliance uh, uh, but, but probably uh, we will live in a totally new world uh, anyway and uh, uh, I do believe that the euro will, will be uh, restored as well with us as a, and we will be the part of that it is happening. That part of it is happening. Um, Katerina, please. Um, you know, Liana, I, um, I, I think that we need to be realistic in terms of um, the real situation. Uh, and I believe that what Ukraine shows um, is a metamodern cultural code in communication with the world. Uh, and at the same time, our uh, main priority for the next maybe 10 years at least would be true healthy modernization. Because we cannot skip stages. We, there was too much, uh, much pre-modern just before the war. We need to go into modern, uh, I mean, we are, we're there, big part of society, of course, we have both modern, postmodern, and metamodern is emerging, I believe, but still the center of gravity needs to be in the modern in the nearest years. And this is just what Mikhail uh, touched upon. It's, it's modernization, it's entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, it's just our task is to make it healthy because in Europe and in States, the modernization has, ha has so many shadows. We can learn and we can integrate uh, the experience and try to make it healthy developments because it's not that we, we need to strive further, we just to make the, the, all the existing levels healthy and nature and evolution will do its work by itself. So this I think should be our priority for the next um, 10, 10 years in all domains, economics, education, um, Medicare, uh, everything. Um, and then, um, yeah, and something I really wanted to um, touch upon regarding the, um, the West and the role of, of your um, country and other Nordic countries and Europe in general. Uh, there is one big thing that I came up with, uh, and I know I'm being a psychologist, I have a hammer and nails and I, I see them everywhere, <laughs> but there is some strong metaphor that I would like to bring uh, into this conversation. Um, when we speak about the individual trauma, we say trauma is not uh, what happening to you, but what is happening in you. And usually trauma happens when there was, with a child, when there was no significant other to help digest the experience, to be with. And we see that children uh, may have the same kind of experience, but those who had the support, they do not have the trauma. Like it doesn't, uh, it's not left in their nervous system. The same kind uh, uh, of metaphor could be used um, with what is happening in Ukraine. So if Ukraine would be alone, 
if we wouldn't have gotten this support, if those significant others, and I do not want to diminish the role of our brave army and wonderful um, leaders like Zaluzhny um, uh, and, and uh, other people who um, hopefully will um, achieve, help us achieve the victory as soon as possible. But if we wouldn't have this shoulder that Europe and states are providing us, the trauma and its effects would be much more significant. In our case, what I see is this blossoming of creativity, blossoming of this inner impulse to act, to take initiative, to, to be with, with the people. And this, so the people are not frozen like it, when it happens with you as a main trauma effect. The people are active. So I'd like just to express gratitude to, to whoever will be listening to, to this uh, postcard from the Western world and just to convey how important it is uh, for us to feel this support, and to feel that we are in the same boat and you are with us uh, by all means until the end, like till the victory. I mean, you're you're fighting for the rest of us, so uh, we we will be there. Um, I mean, I hope we will still be there politically, but we're, we'll still be in it, whether we recognize it or not. So, I mean, we're in this together, um, and you're paying the highest price. Um, but it, it's uh, it's our fight as well. So, um, I mean, the gratitude uh, goes uh, the other direction as well. Absolutely, um, Sergey, please. I'm not a philosopher. That's uh, it's. Uh rather difficult uh, to think and to speak about uh, meta-modernity and uh, the role of this uh, in our future. But uh, I found uh, my hope uh, in the history of uh, Denmark, especially. That period that you say, Lina, uh, when we were the war uh, between Denmark and uh, 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 Austria and Prussia in 1863. Um, three months before uh, 23 February, we studied the archetypes of Ukrainian society with my uh, psychologic uh, uh, Elena Kostruk. And uh, we spoke that uh, the main uh, archetype of uh, Ukrainian society is uh, uh, sorry, I'm, ah, Veror. Veror. Uh, it was very interesting. It was inside for me. It was before the, this hot stage of, of the war. Uh, it was a rather peaceful time uh, in Ukraine. Uh, uh, only in eastern part and Crimea we have the problem. We have this problem. And uh, my uh, psychologist uh, said that, Sergei, you must know that warrior is the main archetype of uh, Ukrainians. Um, the warrior? Warrior, warrior, yeah, warrior, yeah. Warrior, yeah. Warrior, yeah, cool. yeah, yep. yeah. So, sorry, sorry, my English. Yeah, my friends will help uh, with this, yeah. And uh, if you remember, um, Grundvik, uh, uh, studied the uh, um, uh, myth, uh, myths, myths of Scandinavian countries, and he said uh, the same uh, thing about uh, Scandinavian peoples, that the main archetype is uh, uh, wearers. This is the first one. The second one, <clears throat> the main value of Ukrainian society is freedom. And this is uh, very simil similar to Norway countries. Uh, and uh, this is a second argument uh, uh, for my hope uh, that really Mikhail is right. It will be very difficult, very terrible sometimes work. But I think it will be full of hope and full of light because during uh, our Ukrainian history we were rather good as a fighters for freedom but we can't to use this possibility uh, to use freedom for building a new society but now we have this possibility 
and uh, we understand uh, the best model of democ democracy. We uh, see the process of development uh, uh, for high schools in Poland, especially during three years from three uh, folk universities in 2018. Uh, they have now 12 or 13 new uni universities in, in Poland. Uh, that's why I'm sure that it will be very hard, but very interesting work and very interesting life for, for Ukrainians, uh, how to be the uh, equal partner in the big European family. Thank you. Elena, you get the final word. Yeah. Uh... You know, it's uh, very easy to shake a person who doubts their true, their inner core, who don't know what this person is and who are uh, hesitating whether I'm Russian or Ukrainian, whether I'm here or there. Um, um, and uh, it's really hard to shake a person who stands on the firm ground. And uh, I think that... Um, we have gained this uh, firm ground through through these nine months, and uh, we we not only got a critical mass of people uh, who live through those archetypes that that Sergey mentioned, yeah, and who understand the value of freedom and who they are and what it means to be Ukrainian, even if ethnically they are Crimean Tatars or Russians or Belarusians or uh, whatever. Um, and uh, having this vast majority of people who realize who they are, um, they are either fighting for it in the trenches or they are defending it uh, through other instruments. Because um, it seems that this war has become really very, very personal to many, many Ukrainians. And it's not like uh, those who were not able to be in the trenches they were trying to do something on their own level. And uh, uh, from there, it seems we will be able to stop, start building up something which will not be simply copy pasting from other cultures, trying to implement some American approach or Danish approach or whatever. We will start building from this core and um, I will just give you one example, which I have been witnessing again and again and again. I have participated in a number of uh, online and offline conferences, and uh, most of uh, visitors uh, of participants from Ukraine were women. It's understandable why. And uh, um, I have been witnessing one the same story, like somebody uh, would come and uh, start telling us what to do. Like, uh, yeah, let's think about peace building. Let's think about uh, putting another cheek. Let's think about, let's build peace with Russians. Let's stop the war, etc., etc. And it was so interesting to see that all those women that were present there, they were like saying one and the same thing. They were saying, no, it's not going to work like this. And uh, those women were in different countries from different regions, but they all felt the same thing. And um, I think we've got this really intensive unity and we should do something really great with it. Uh, but as Mikhail said, it will be super multi-layered because we will have to deal not only with material things like rebuilding the infrastructure, and industries and homes, etc. We'll also have to deal with uh, building uh, a democratic society, with educating ourselves in a new way. And as Katrina said, we will have to heal uh, the psychological trauma, but also physical traumas and uh, building um, the society with the new principles, which will integrate all those different all those new shades that we have, we'll, we will inbuilt, we will need to inbuild our resilience, which we have gained through those nine years, uh, nine months and years as well. 
but also inclusivity to include those who left and then come back and those who were injured and perhaps lost their mobility and we will need to build the whole infrastructure considering those people who actually suffered from the war or who gave their health for us to preserve this freedom. So I'm thinking these are our future challenges. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's always a pleasure talking to you. I'm glad we could make this. Um, I, uh, I hope that this uh, war will end soon uh, in a just way and in a peaceful way, in a lasting peaceful way. And uh, Slava Ukraini. Jeroen Slava. Jeroen Slava. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. Thank you. Take care.